Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. Immediate economic concerns and pressing national security issues tend to grab our attention while long-term environmental and energy issues tend to be viewed separately and as more on the back burner. However, as today's speakers recognize, our approach to energy and the environment has a direct bearing on and is inextricably intertwined with the economy and national security. And these speakers come to this issue with impressive military credentials in recognizing the national security implications in this area. Retired Vice Admiral Dennis V. McGinn served 35 years with the U.S. Navy as a naval aviator, test pilot, aircraft carrier commanding officer, and national security strategist. He commanded the U.S. Third Fleet and was Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Requirements and Programs at the Pentagon. Admiral McGinn serves as co-chairman of the CNA Military Advisory Board and as president of the American Council on Renewable Energy. He is a widely recognized energy and national security expert. He received a BS degree in naval engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy, attended the national security program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and was a fellow at the U.S. Naval War College. Our other distinguished speaker is former Senator John W. Warner. Prior to his storied Senate career, John Warner served with distinction for two periods of active military duty, the first as an enlisted sailor in the final years of World War II, and second as lieutenant in the U.S. Marines with the 1st Marine Air Wing in Korea from 1950 to 1952. After completing his law degree at the University of Virginia, Senator Warner clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and from 1955 to 1960, he was with the uh, Department of Justice. Senator Warner then had a successful law practice, and in 1972 was named Secretary of the Navy. He was elected to the Senate from Virginia in 1978. During his 30 years in the Senate, Senator Warner focused on national security, foreign affairs, and intelligence. He served on the Senate Armed Services Committee, including three periods as chairman, and for many years he served on the Senate Intelligence Committee and served as vice chairman. He established himself as one of the most respected and influential senators on national security issues. The Pew Project on National Security, Energy, and Climate is dedicated to highlighting the critical links between national security, energy independence, the economy, and climate change. In this area, as in their careers, today's speakers are superheroes. Think of them as the Avengers. <laughs> Please welcome to the City Club former Senator John Warner and Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. Thank you. Thank you. And first, I believe, Senator Warner. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply humbled to have this opportunity to be here with my dear and valued friend, Denny McGinn. Uh, I was a petty officer in the Navy, and he's a three-star admiral, so if you keep <laughs> seeing me, I bend down like this. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. But uh, this institution really exemplifies what America is about. Citizens coming together on a voluntary basis, giving of their time and their experience and sharing their views together for the greater betterment of our fellow citizens. And it's the best way to try and get a message to America is to be with folks like yourself and to have the opportunity for the media to chop at us a little bit and, and get bits of it and disseminated far and wide. So thank you for what you're doing. Also, having spent 30 years in the Senate, I had rule number one. Whenever I went, looked forward to getting out of Washington and went back to my state to visit the small towns and the villages and the big cities and so forth, I read the day's paper in that community before I ever addressed an audience. And I brought... Uh, a copy of that paper with me today, but I did so with a sense of sadness, but a sense of great respect, because it 
on the front page is what America's all about. You're honoring one of your sons who gave his life in Afghanistan, right there on page one where it belongs. I got it right this way. There he is, he's coming home to be with you and to be remembered and to deserve your respect and admiration. Having served myself very modestly compared to this man's extraordinary career, we always must be mindful that this country is what we are today and will be tomorrow because of generations of men and women who've gone forward and worn the uniform of our country and thereby enabled the rest of us to have a quality of life and plan for our own futures and that of our families in a way that we wish under the fundamental precepts of our Constitution and freedom. So we pause here today in a moment of reverence for this family, but that's been replicated all over the country. Fortunately, the casualties of the current combat don't approach the casualties of previous ones that I had some familiarity with. But the point is, we got to be ever mindful. And the Pew Foundation very wisely determined that they wanted to tell the story of the American service person as he or she was involved in another conflict. And that is America's survivability with the closer of the energy problems all over the world. We're a global society. We're a global economy. And energy is a global product available to all. Two momentous things happened in 2009. One, I was privileged, and I underline privileged, to have concluded 30 years in the United States Senate. And the other is that China became number one in consuming the world's energy supply. They superseded the United States of America. And now that has continued in the time that has elapsed. And their people are looking to share a quality of life that we take for granted. To own for the first time an automobile. I've owned a dozen or more. And each of you have had yours. But there's the first time. Their roads and highways and other things are being developed. And that takes energy. Huge amounts of energy. And they're a country that's dependent on importing energy, as is the United States of America. So Pew is set out to tell the story of the men and women in uniform as they individually and collectively be they generals or privates or sergeants or petty officers or whatever. All through the military today is a culture, a new culture. It wasn't there when the good Admiral and I were proudly to wear the uniform, but it's there today of how we can do more with less energy and in turn let America import less energy and save our dollars here at home for jobs and our economy rather than export the billion dollars almost weekly that we send abroad just to pay for the energy that we import. So that story, I think, brings to my mind and brings together what it's all about. So with that, I'll leave the floor to my dear friend here, the Admiral, to have a few words. Admiral? Thank you, Petty Officer because Warner. Because we come. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record, I'd We've like to come to learn and listen <laughs> from you, and we want to get to your questions and your involvement. I'd like to point out uh, for the record that uh, when uh, Petty Officer Warner uh, rose in the ranks, shall we say, 
in the, in the Navy and Marine Corps. He ended up as the uh, Secretary of the Navy, and I was then a lieutenant. So I think that uh, relationship <laughs> defines, uh, defines it a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, before we go on, we're at the Goodyear Tire Company today, and he was, and he, he's usually a very modest man, but he landed and took off the same number of times on a carrier deck and only blew out one tire his entire career, and that was a Goodyear tire. You had to tell him that. <laughs> Actually, I took pains to point out that it was not a Goodyear tire. <laughs> if it had been, it wouldn't have blown. Because <laughs> surely I didn't do anything wrong. It must have been a material failure. It wasn't pilot error. It is a great, great privilege and an honor to be back here in Cleveland and at the Cleveland City Club. Uh, I'm returning after about 18 months. I was here last in uh, January of 2010. There have been a lot of things that have happened. And reflecting on some of the points that uh, Senator Warner made, since January of 2010, our nation has uh, shipped about $550 billion out of our economy at the rate of $1 billion a day to pay for our oil addiction. That's over $1 trillion. So as we look to Washington and what's going to come out of the, uh, the Joint Congressional Committee trying to deal with the deficit, and they're looking for $1.2 trillion of savings in some way or increases in revenue, as the case may be. Think about that. In a mere 18 months, we have sent over a half a trillion dollars out of our economy to pay for our oil. This oil addiction is a national security problem. It is a national security that has urgency and importance beyond the actions that we are taking as Americans and certainly beyond the actions that our elected officials are taking. We need to realize that we are paying a price not just in dollars but in lives. Since I was here in January, more than 100 young men and women in the uniform of our nation have given their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan because they were out guarding convoys or, or escorting convoys of oil to get to the front. And that continues to this day. Recognizing this, the good news is the Department of Defense has done a wonderful job in increasing its focus and really taking bold actions to deal with reliance on fossil fuels. Specifically, I'd like to just cite quickly the experience of India Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. They deployed to Sangin and Helmand Province in December of last year. It was one of the toughest places in the whole country. And they suffered 25% casualties, either killed or wounded, within weeks after arriving in that fight. As luck would have it, though, they had deployed with what the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, General Jim Conway, thought was very, very important equipment to try to reduce the amount of petroleum that they were using out there in those forward operating bases. So they had some solar panels that they had arrayed. You see them around town here, right in the United States fixed solar panels. They had some nice backpack carrying solar panels that could uh, be used out on these reconnaissance missions where they wanted to be stealthy and secret. And instead of having to carry 25 pounds of batteries, they could go out there with one set of batteries for their communications equipment, their sensors, their GPS, and not have to worry about resupply in the middle of the mission by a Humvee or a, a Huey helicopter giving away their position. Meanwhile, Back at the uh, forward operating base, they cut their reliance on diesel fuel to power the diesel generators by 90%, simply because they had very, very high efficient lighting, for example, other efficiency devices, and they had these solar panels that were uh, not completely eliminating, but greatly reducing the reliance on fossil fuel. That takes a lot of convoys off the road when you multiply it across our military presence. It's not happening today because this is a very early stage demonstration deployment. But it 
bodes very, very well for the men and women in uniform in future missions that they are going to be less exposed and less dependent. Now, the kicker on this story for me is that that forward operating base with these solar panels came under attack. And I got pictures of it, and you could just barely see some uh, uh, aberrations in the smooth face of the solar panels. Turns out that it was uh, attacked by Taliban, and it suffered, they, the solar array suffered fragment, fragment damage from RPGs, rocket propelled grenades. The Marines won the fight, things calmed down, and they never knew that there was damage to the solar panel because they kept producing electricity. Can you imagine if they had had a diesel generator set that had got those grenade fragments? It was just a great illustration in my mind that the United States Marines, and indeed all of our armed services, are leading the way, not because they want to get some environmental award, good that they may be, that might be, but because it is good for mission effectiveness. It saves lives. It makes them more effective in their primary mission. And I would say to everyone in Cleveland and Ohio and in the United States of America that if renewable energy and energy efficiency is good enough for our United States Marines in Afghanistan, what are we waiting for? Let's get on with the mission. Let's get it deployed and let's reap the benefits of job creation. Let's reap the benefits of local, regional, and global environmental health. Let's reap the benefits of national security so that we can start chipping away one gallon, one kilowatt hour at a time at our over-dependence on fossil fuel. This is a good news opportunity for America, and we can do it together. I look forward to your questions, and let's have a good discussion. I want to pick up one thing the Admiral said. It was very important. The Department of Defense, in its budgets, and that was my job in the Congress for many, many years, was to see that that department was adequately funded and the men and women and their families. But they had the research money to go out and start up and encourage the private sector to start up and use innovations to create new sources of energy, biofuels, solar, wind, and to how to integrate that on the basis across the United States. And they made tremendous progress. Now they're at the juncture where they've proven that they can fly a fighter aircraft, the type that you flew for so many years, with a drop-in fuel made from wood chips or semolina grass or all kinds of things out there. But we're at that point where we've got to transition in quantities of that type of fuel so that it's cost competitive with the imported fuel that we're going to hopefully lessen. Well, our purpose here today is to learn from this audience and a subsequent audience we're going to uh, be with here this afternoon, what's going on in this community. As we did it with the tire company this morning, I frankly didn't realize you could take the automobile tire, which we accept when we go to buy a new car, I'm more concerned about the paint job and what the in interior looks like and what the power of the engine and pay little attention to the jobs. But innovation right here in Ohio, right here in this plant, right up here, a few miles away, have developed tire that l burn, I mean, less power, saving the power and saving fuel. And these tires are now designed so that if you look out over the lifespan of the car, you've saved a lot of money in purchasing the fuel. That's the type of innovation that America is moving forward with today. And we're here to hear that story from you. I mentioned uh, to Senator Warner, uh, just as we finished our tour at uh, Goodyear, I had high expectations about seeing a wonderful American company with global reach and global impact. And my uh, expectations were wildly exceeded. It was a wonderful briefing on uh, the innovation that's going on there, reducing ro so-called rolling resistance that has fuel savings of anywhere from 4 to 7%. And this is the type of innovation that's going to allow us, tire companies, component manufacturers, automobile manufacturers, 
to achieve a corporate average fuel economy standard of 54.2 miles per gallon by 2025. We're already on a track to get to 35 and a half miles per gallon by 2016, but we will get there through the great innovations of, of companies, large global companies like Goodyear, but we will also get there by the kinds of small business innovations and small companies that are in the clean energy technology in the automobile sector, in the residential construction business, in commercial and in full industrial, we will get there. And it is so much a part of our American fabric. It's so much a part of the great Ohio legacy of rising to the occasion and solving problems that America has. And keeping our jobs here at home and creating new jobs. Floor is open there. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special forum featuring the Honorable John Warner and Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. We will return to our speakers in a moment for the traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and please remember to keep them brief. We remind you that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums, and we hope everyone listening will support the City Club, hopefully join, and become active in our ongoing civic dialogue. Please visit our website to see a full schedule of our upcoming programs. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Today is the Herbert and Nettie Borstein Forum, made possible by a generous endowment gift from Herbert and Nettie Borstein. We are pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by our strategy group and Pew. Thank you for joining us today. Now we'd like to return to our speakers for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. Senator and Admiral, uh, I was fortunate a couple of years ago to be in San Diego and looking across the harbor, uh, saw the USS Ronald Reagan sitting there, this giant aircraft carrier, which is what, one of a dozen aircraft carriers we have. 5,000 sailors serve on that ship, and the whole thing is shoved around the world by a nuclear uh, power plant. Is there, uh, the, the, the military does not seem to have had the problems with nuclear power that uh, we have had, the Russians have had, the, obviously the Japanese have recently had. What lessons are there in the military's use of nuclear power that we're missing in the private sector? I'd like to uh, answer that in part and then yield to my dear friend and colleague. I must say from a personal note on it, um, I was in a helicopter one day flying over the Newport News Shipbuilding Dry Dock Company and I looked down and I saw, uh, that's in my state, Virginia, uh, this carrier being built, and I turned to my military aide who was flying with me at that time. I said, what is its name? It hadn't been named yet. And I put in the name Ronald Reagan and before the Congress with some other senators and named that ship for a wonderful man that I was privileged to know and, and enjoy many sessions working on behalf of uh, our country together. Um, as Secretary of the Navy, I inherited for over five years the positions in the Navy Department working with Admiral Rickover on the Navy nuclear program. Much of it is owing to his genius, I'll tell you that right now, and his decision to push and push and push until the Navy began to accept the concept and incorporate that type of power in its submarines. Then it went to the surface vessels. And in due course, we learned that they was a, the best way to power the carriers, of course, was with nuclear power. The other surface ships, it was less efficient, and therefore we tried it for a while, 
and no longer do we incorporate it in surface ships other than carriers, it's in the submarines. But proudly the Navy can point to all of its years, half century just about, in nuclear power without a fatal accident. It is clearly an example to industry in this country that those same safety standards, if adopted, we could have hopefully the same record here in this country. But unfortunately, we did have accidents. Three Mile Island, and that was the start of the decline of our momentum towards having more <coughs> private sector nuclear power. It's resurrected itself now, and it's back. We have two nuclear plants being built right now as we're in this room. The tragedy in Japan, we won't try and explain it because everybody read enough about it, but they did locate those plants on known fault lines. They did locate them in areas where, where perhaps never had been historically that type of a tsunami effect ashore. But anyway, errors were made. The Japanese are doing their best. I, we have nothing but sadness and empathy for the people who've suffered. But it has set back some of the momentum. But I'm hopeful that we can overcome that type of tragedy and keep going ahead in America to develop safe nuclear power. We've got an excellent regulatory system that takes care of it in the federal government and the individual states, and we can do it safely and should make it a component of our overall nuclear, I mean, electrical primarily input. About 20 to 22 percent of our electrical power today is generated by nuclear plants. I would simply add that we have uh, operating currently 104 nuclear power plants across the United States. And as uh, Senator Warner pointed out, around 20 22 percent of our total electric power is produced there. Trying to displace that much electricity with other forms of uh, energy, uh, it would be very, very difficult. So I think that we should, at a minimum, maintain uh, that uh, level of power produced by nuclear and perhaps even expand it. The key question is, what are, what are the costs? I am comfortable, based on my Navy experience of 35 years and and having lived and worked on many nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carriers, that it can be done safely for the reasons that uh, Senator Warner mentioned. But we need to uh, take a good look at how we can increase the designs, the inherent safety of them, uh, the, the siting. And I think that we, as we speak, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is uh, making uh, even greater strides to address what is a very reliable and safe industry, nuclear power industry in this country, to make it even safer using some of the lessons learned from the F Fukushima disaster. One further fact, France, between 70 and 80 percent of it, all of its electrical power is generated and has been done safely through the years, many years. Another clear example of a good safety record. This question also is addressed to Senator Warner. <clears throat> you start out your sp talk today by speaking about Afghanistan and a local casualty. It's now been 10 full years since we've been in Afghanistan. And while at the end of this year, uh, President Obama has pledged to bring home 10,000 of our tr troops who are there, that's less than 10% of the people who are there, uh, it took us a long time to get out of Vietnam and we're getting all our people out of Iraq, hopefully this year. And my question basically is, Senator, after your 30 years of experience in the United States Senate, what's, what, is, what is it going to take to get our troops and our military activity out of Afghanistan? We were searching originally for Obama's bin Laden. But we found him after a long search in Afghanistan to be within one of our allies in Pakistan. So what is it going to take get us out of Afghanistan once and for all? That question, and I thank you for that question, because America is deeply concerned, as you individually have spoken very eloquently on that subject. Uh, I've been to Afghanistan a number of times in the capacity as chairman of the Armed Services Committee and a member of the committee. 
And it's a culture that goes back for generations. And that culture is divided. Each little valley has its own chieftain or province director. And, and it's very difficult for the form of government, be it the democracy we like to enjoy here in the United States or parliamentary systems or other free nations, how they govern their people. It's very difficult to transition from a tribal society to one governed by a central government. And it, we see the constant fighting as that struggle goes forth. But the presence of our forces there enables that, nations, that nation to try and achieve those goals, to try and achieve a military force suitable to maintain that democracy and to let it function safely and freely have the votes of the people to elect the new members. And it's just going to take time. And you say we've been there nine years, you're right. We sort of turned our back on it for a while after the initial successes we had in helping those people get started with their democracy and, and concentrated on Iraq. But we're back there now. It's also a crossroads of the world of diplomacy. It also is a nation that borders Pakistan, which has nuclear weapons. And should those we weapons ever fall into the hands of individuals involved in these terrorist movements worldwide, it would be devastating, not only for Afghanistan and Pakistan, but for the rest of the world. So there's a lot of thinking that's going into how we go about a slow withdrawal of our troops as President Obama has taken that initiative. Let them build up their own forces and their own security to shore up their government in hopes that it will eventually function and serve the people and allow them to have a greater expression of freedom, particularly the women. Thank you both for coming. Um, thank you for your service to our country. And thank you for taking up this really important challenge to our country now. And my question has to do with bicycles. Last year, I had the opportunity to be in Amsterdam, where bicycles are a very predominant mode of transportation, and in Copenhagen, where they're also, you see them all over the place, and where a third of the people commute to work by bicycles. Um, they use a, f a form of energy that we have a surplus of, it contributes to the health of their people. Uh, and yet in this country, it doesn't seem to be part of the, the, our efforts to really get on top of energy. Um, do you think there's a role there? And what do you think it's going to take to really be effective in this country? I, I would start by saying that uh, uh, it's one form of being able to not only reduce our energy use, but to improve our quality of life and our, and our health. But it's only one form. I, I'm happy to report that in Washington, D.C., they recently instituted uh, a bicycle sharing program where you can sign up, and uh, there are bicycle racks strategically located around the, uh, the District of Columbia, where you can just put your card in, grab a bike, and head for your destination, drop it off at the, uh, the, the local rack, and, and press on. And bike lanes in, uh, in uh, the uh, streets are, are much much better, much better engineered. But I think we need to do a lot of things. I'm glad you mentioned bicycles, though, because bicycles are something that we can all identify with. It's something we see in our daily lives. And the problem with talking about energy challenges is that it gets very abstract and very, very complex quickly. Even when you talk, or I talk, about nuclear power, for example. But we can do so much in our own lives, as families, as businesses, as industries, to save a tremendous amount of energy and to improve our quality of life at the same time. I'll give you a good example for right here in, in uh, northeastern Ohio. There's a term called combined heat and power, or waste energy recovery. Basically, think about a smokestack in any type of industry or business that has 
millions of uh, BTUs, British thermal units of, of energy, going up the stack every day. Now just imagine that you have a little bowl here on the table that is filled with $100 bills, and you're just feeding this with this flaming bowl of $100 bills a couple at a time, that is the kind of money that is just being completely wasted that can be recovered by waste energy recovery systems or combined heat and power systems that will directly benefit the businesses that put this in. It takes an investment, but it's an investment that very rapidly is paid back in the form of a reduction in the consumption of whatever form of electricity or whatever form of, uh, of fossil fuel that is powering that activity. This is uh, an example that I think we can think about in our homes. We use so much energy that we think is uh, directly related to our quality of life. It is, but we waste so much more energy than we need to to have a terrific quality of life. I'm not talking about uh, shivering in the winter or sweating in the summer. I'm talking about using smart technology. Many, many companies, clean technology companies that we're going to be talking to right here in, in Cleveland uh, after this, after this uh, club meeting that are producing solutions that can really, really reduce our reliance on traditional forms of energy by energy efficiency and use alternative ways of producing energy. To pick up on Admiral McGinn's point, our overall nationwide and individual efforts, collectively and singularly, to work our way out of this dependence on foreign oil is going to be a multiplicity of thousands of ideas, small ones. Bikes help in a small way, but an important way. We just can't rely on the big ideas like nuclear power it's going to be a multitude of small ones. And I was given this today, and it's manufactured by someone in this room who, if he'll identify himself, tell us about this thing right now, because it comes in like the bike. This is what the hikers can do in hiking or walking to and from your office to save energy. Take it away there, young man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, what you have in your hand is the N-Power PEG. It stands for Personal Energy Generator. It's a product that uh, my company, Tremont Electric, makes here in the uh, city of Cleveland. Ninety percent of our supply chain comes from the state of Ohio. This is a product uh, that uh, is uh, sold domestically right now, uh, but uh, we, have, we have orders that are outside of, um, uh, outside of the country. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're in that growth curve to be able to deliver this product worldwide. Now, this is a device that, that uh, you simply place inside of a backpack, a briefcase, or a purse. As you walk along, it harvests your human kinetic energy, so you're up and down I walking. I mean, this should point out, this thing goes up and down. Yes, sir. See that, folks? <laughs> Fairly simple. <laughs> Don't shock yourself, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Now, that, that's generating electricity. Now, explain how that electricity supplants the batteries that the soldiers are carrying in their backpacks now, heavily laden down, they want to lighten it. Explain how that energy is put to use. Um, currently with the product in your hand, uh, what, it uh, stores it on board its internal battery and then you're able to uh, plug in a wire and be able to download that power. Uh, Tremont Electric is presently working on a um, modified armor system uh, with uh, some of our other partners uh, to be able to tap into the, to, to the full power uh, that's available to us as, as uh, dismounted soldiers are in, in uh, combat situations. Will Great. it charge your cell phone? Uh, that one will. All yes, right. it will. But there's a practical application. Thank you, and congratulations. Um, uh, you're uh, uh, absolutely right that there are a lot of smart solutions that will help us uh, save energy. Uh, right here in Cleveland at the Museum of Natural History, there's a smart home uh, designed to meet the passive house standard and use about 90% less heating and cooling energy. Um, so there are great innovations that we can all see uh, right here in, in Cleveland. Um, my question is, is this, though. Um, as we all uh, burn more fossil fuels, uh, emit more greenhouse gases, uh, we're destabilizing the Earth's climate. Um, and that can also cause um, societies around the, the world to be destabilized. If you could speak more about the national security implications sure. of that, it would be very interesting. 
In, when I was last uh, here at the Cleveland City Club, I talked about a report the, that the CNA Military Advisory Board, led by uh, former Chief of Staff of the Army Gordon Sullivan, uh, let, was chairman of, and put out a report in April of 2007 that was called Climate Change and the Threat to National Security. And it was groundbreaking in that a group of about a dozen national security military experts, if you will, three and four star retired officers, were talking about something that had been debated over uh, several years by folks who were environmentally concerned and folks who were business concerned and not much progress. Enter this new voice of national security. And the conclusion of that report was that climate change in the severe weather events that will be more frequent and more intense going forward as the Earth's atmosphere slowly but inexorably heats up for, for whatever cause, is going to cause uh, or be a threat multiplier for instability in critical regions of the world. And that means that the added pressure of natural disasters, be they multi-year droughts, wiping out food crops, or uh, torrential rains associated with typhoons or mo monsoon seasons, are going to add pressure to already fragile societies and already fragile governments, and they will fail. And into that uh, failure, that vacuum of power, will rush a lot of bad characters. Organized crime, paramilitaries, terrorists, just as we've seen over the past 20 years in uh, the nation of Somalia. Once again, 20 years after the first operation of the United States called Restore Hope in Somalia, we have literally hundreds of thousands of people starving there because of a combination of failed government and pressure from the climate, pressure from the severe weather. In this case, a prolonged drought. So we want to recognize that uh, we may not be able to control uh, Mother Nature all the time, but we certainly can do things that will uh, either help or hinder Mother Nature in preserving the type of natural environment for us and the creatures we sh share this uh, earth with in a much better way. And, and it isn't a sacrifice to do that. It is really a blessing to be able to increase our quality of life, as I mentioned before, by using less energy and using the energy that we do use in a smarter, more efficient way. So I think that uh, there's, a, there's a nexus here, there's a connection between climate security, national security, economic security and the creation of jobs, and our overall energy security. These things are all connected, and it starts with how we get our energy, how we get it to where we can use it, and how we use it. And we can make great strides across the board by really, really making the clean energy uh, technology economy happen, happen sooner, starting right here in northeastern Ohio. Let me add to that story. I was actually in the United States uh, and on the Armed Services Committee course when Black Hawk went down in Somalia. And I was asked by the then chairman with another senator to, to go over and write the official report for the Senate on what happened. And as the Admiral pointed out, it was the loss of political stability into which the bad guys came, began to exploit. The human suffering was beyond description. And guess what? It has not changed since the many years ago that I personally went there to be with our troops and to figure out how best we could begin to extract our troops and move on. But the point is that the United States of America is called upon by the world to come and respond to these catastrophes with our equipment because we're operating as a military in a hundred different nations. We have the most ships, the most aircraft, the doctors, the medical teams, and each of those things that are essential and the time sensitivity to get them there to alleviate the human suffering. That's why our military in its doctrine are developing how we deal and plan for these missions, which often, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a Democrat, public, or a Repub 
Democrat or Republican in the White House, all presidents have said America tries to help others in times of their critical need, and we have the equipment to do it and do do it. About a year ago, I had the privilege of talking to a recently returned U.S. Army captain. He had uh, served in humanitarian assistance, disaster relief scenarios. He had served in Iraq. He had served a tour in Afghanistan. And we were talking about this uh, nexus of uh, national security and energy security. And he said, Admiral, having been over there and, uh, and continued uh, to serve for so many tours, I was just struck by how great a nation we have. But he said, I would love to see solar panels and wind farms and energy efficiency in all of our businesses and homes and industries be the victory gardens of the 21st century. We can rise as a society together to, att to attack these challenges and to turn them right on their head and make them opportunities. And I'm old enough to know that I planted our victory garden during World War II. <laughs> yes, but sir. But you're not that old. I, I think I had one of those beats, That's uh, my story, the victory garden, and you're stealing <laughs> my story. Over here. Um, we're trying to build a victory garden out in Lake Erie with a demonstration wind project and very interested in how the federal government procures electricity and how you go about deciding um, buying power and creating incentives for these new industries to be created and most importantly to create jobs and investment here in the United States. Well, we had a dramatic uh, development yesterday on that subject by the United States Army where the Secretary of the Army, right here in Ohio, where there was a major conference of uh, people involved in energy and how the military can best access the energy in the commercial sector for its own uses on its basis. So we're moving ahead to partner up the U.S. military with the commercial availability of energy for our military bases. That's just one step forward. But basically, in the wind power, it will always be an important contributor to the energy needs. But we've got to solve a major problem, and that is most of the wind is generated in terms of significant power at night, and you know that better than I do. And often you've got to, you've got to store that energy until the peak use by the home, which is roughly from 6.30 at night until 10.30, that's the thing that's a challenge before America to develop the batteries and the ability to store the valuable wind energy. I think that's uh, a good case that we need a portfolio of energy choices that Senator Warner made a while ago. And one of those uh, elements of the portfolio, I think, is natural gas. There's still a lot of work to be done to be able to figure out how to in safely and environmentally responsibly exploit that, uh, that technology right here in eastern Ohio, the Marcellus uh, Shale extending westward from, from Pennsylvania. And I think that uh, we could have a combined power system whereby when the wind is blowing, I love the price of fuel. It's zero. When the wind isn't blowing, I love the fact that I can continue to produce whatever electricity is needed by the ability to use that much cleaner and more available resource called natural gas. So I think a hybrid solution, if you will, something that, uh, that creates some synergy and, and is able to meet our demands. We harvest the free energy of solar and, and uh, wind, geothermal, biomass, whenever we can but we augment it with the right kinds and the right amounts of fossil fuel where we must. And I think that this is a great transitional form of energy. Let me just mention, you say zero cost for wind. Now, let's, let this gentleman tell you how expensive it was to build that windmill. So there was some cost. What would you like to see Uncle Sam doing that it's not doing with reference to wind? I think that what it needs to do is, as the elect, um, when the federal government chooses to buy electricity, 
that they create some incentives for a small part of that electricity purchase to support these new technologies and new innovations so that they can be competitive with existing forms of energy generation, primarily uh, coal and nuclear and the other opportunities, so that it has a chance to succeed as opposed to trying to look to private investment to, to bridge that gap. I think you'll be seeing that increasingly uh, going forward. For example, the overall Department of Defense has a, shall we say, a, we don't call it that, but a renewable energy standard of 25% by 2025. That's a big, big amount of progress for the largest consumer of energy by one, any one organization in our nation. And increasingly, the Department of Defense is going to be uh, using privately developed and uh, publicly partnered sources of energy like wind as part of power purchase agreements, longer term contracting authority that will enable uh, the uh, investors in clean energy technology to lower the cost of investments and the risk because they have a good customer. All right, we got to kind of shorten our uh, responses. There's a lot of questions pending. Uh, th thank you for your comments and for the armed services support for deploying energy efficiency technology and advanced energy. Um, the leadership that the arm, armed services are taking I see, I see is in stark contrast to the leadership that we're seeing in Congress and, and as far as advancing energy efficiency. And, this would be your energy. question, Senator. I, 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 my question is related to how are the armed services uh, and, and are educating our congressional representatives on how you're utilizing the technology and, and the advantages of util, utilizing energy efficiency and well, advanced energy. The, the armed services regularly testify before the Congress. And the option is there for Congress to go as deeply as they wish into what the Pentagon is doing. That's one of the valuable functions, if I may say, of the Pew Report. We're writing that report up. Our next report, which Phyllis, you're not paying attention, is going to be <laughs> is going to be finished and released on Capitol Hill on what day? September 20th. And we're going to have a lot of congressional there to tell them the story of what the military is doing. All right, let's try and get another question or two in here before we wrap up. This gentleman over here has been very patient. <laughs> Why don't you forget the mic here. and just get up and tell the story? <laughs> She's got the. I'll be very quick. I think this club needs two mics. <laughs> <laughs> I, my question is a simple one. What can be done, Senator, to diffuse the influence of the lobbyists that you had to uh, be working with when you were in the Senate? Because they seem to be one of the main obstacles to getting a lot of things done. And if they represent certain of these energy groups, they do all they can to decrease the influence of what you really need to do in the environmental role in this country? Well, the concept of lobbying, the word lobbying emanated from Great Britain, where in the Houses of Parliament there was a little ante room where they all stood as the members came in to vote and exit, and they grabbed the members and talked to them, and that's where lobbyists. And that's been the part of the way the, the Congress has operated. Congress should operate with the greatest degree of transparency possible. And today, with the complexity and the great number of issues, a member of Congress cannot possibly keep up to date on all the latest technology. Frankly, the lobbyists have been helpful to inform Congress about things that otherwise they may not have had an opportunity to learn about. So your, your skillful member of Congress, be he or she, a senator or a house person has got to learn how to deal with the lobbyists, get that information that they need to translate into legislation, and at the same time, sharp elbows to take those and knock them out when they know they're simply there for one thing and one thing alone, and it isn't maybe for the greater good of the country. That comes from 30 years of experience in the Senate. And believe me, these elbows were sharp and worked. <laughs> I, I would uh, simply add as a, as a citizen that we are the most powerful lobbyists. If we get out there and we exercise right. our right to, to vote, vote, our elected officials and, and this public servant who has served uh, so many, many years, 
uh, in public service, and 30 of them in the Senate, is a great example of what uh, citizens, informed citizens can do to get the kind of leadership in Washington and in Columbus and in Cleveland that we want. Well spoken. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to, a, to former U.S. Senator John Warner and Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.